Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever time you're watching worship, welcome to worship. Surely the Lord is in this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. This is the day the Holy One calls us to worship. Our invitation to prayer comes from page 406 of the hymnal, Canticle of Prayer. We do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For all who ask, receive. All who seek, find. And to those who knock, it will be opened. As we come to moments with the Master, let us go to the Lord in prayer. O 
Oh, Lord, this has been a week where we have experienced, as much of the nation has, the deep chill of an Arctic blast that extends all the way to the Gulf Coast. We think of Texas and the struggle with keeping the electrical grid up, of keeping people warm. We think of the homeless. It's not supposed to be like this that far south. And so we ask for the creativity, the compassion, the caring to provide for those who struggle to keep warm, for the generosity of your people to Feed those that need a warm meal. We thank you for crews that are out working to restore power. And we ask for your safety. That you keep your protective hand on them as they deal with the challenges before them, whether it's the the power lines or the inclement weather, or the ice. We thank you, Father, for the fact that we can gather together. Oh, yeah, we're in separate locations, but we are one in your spirit. And we would ask during this time of worship, you would warm our hearts. You did it for Wesley. And we talk about his heart strangely warmed. We even have it on coffee cups. It's kind of become our motto. But today we ask for it to be a real life experience. We pray for our country, Lord. We talk about unity. We hear our leaders talk about unity, but we are more deeply divided than ever. That unity, well, it, it comes from things like confession, seeking forgiveness, for the grace to grant forgiveness. It comes through things like seeing beyond our individual agendas to what is best for the common good. It comes as we turn to biblical principle as foundation for making decisions. where life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are more than just cliches, but principles that guide us. As we journey towards the cross, we pray, Father, that you will open our eyes to seek you, to knock, to ask as you tell us to, to let our requests be made known to you. We can become so filled with stress anxiety, worry, 
concerns about this and that. That faith gets put on the sidelines. Forgive us, O Lord, and renew a right spirit within us. That we will indeed put our hand in yours. And that you will walk with us. You will talk with us. And you will flat out say, hey, you're mine. I won't leave you. I won't forsake you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We pray, Father, for those needing that sustaining grace for healing, as well as the healing itself. Thank you for honoring us with your presence and teaching us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is not the work of one person that brings us to the goal. It's the everlasting teamwork of every generous soul. With that thought in mind, we place our offering in our offering plate. And thank you for remembering to put it in the mail come Monday. Let us pray. O Lord of hosts, whose loving hand has given us all that we have, Grant us grace that we may honor you through our giving. O Lord of holiness, may you pour out your spirit on these gifts and those who give, that your name may be glorified through both. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Scripture reading comes from the book of Exodus, from the 20th chapter, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or female servant, or your cattle, or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
much, much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. Covert. It's a word cloaked in mystery and in intrigue. It's something right out of a Tom Clancy novel like Clear and Present Danger. In the book, The Colombian Cartel's Illegal Drug Activity into the United States presents a clear and present danger to national security. Thus, a covert operation was launched to destabilize their operations covert. It's not all fiction as in the Mission Impossible movies. There is historical evidence that gives credence to fictional accounts. For example, covert operations in America can be traced back to George Washington and the American Revolution. Washington had a secret intelligent network that was instrumental in providing crucial information. According to the History Channel, quote, George Washington was more deeply involved in intelligence operations than any American general-in-chief until Dwight Eisenhower in World War II, end quote. Some of the covert activities were shrouded in shadows and secrecy. Others were out there in plain sight for all to see. That is, if they knew what to look for. A case in point was Anna Strong, whose job was reportedly to relay signals to couriers smuggling intelligence through Long Island Sound. If Anna hung out a black petticoat, it signaled that a message was ready to be picked up by a courier. Another tactic was signaling the secret pickup spot by the number of handkerchiefs that she put out on the line. I mean, the British saw it. They saw handkerchiefs, but to the Americans, they saw a message. It's an example of seeing, but not really seeing, when it came to the British. In a sense, it parallels covert cows. Now you may go, covert cows? The question was how to penetrate the fast food market where burgers are king. Is there any way to compete with an old lady asking, where's the beef? It sounds like a mission that is impossible. Unless, unless you have covert cows. They have become advertising icons, especially the three-dimensional billboards along high traffic areas. Their modus operandi, the sign says, Eat more chicken. Chick-fil-A's advertising campaign has stood the test of time. The secret to their success? Well, according to psychology today, animal research demonstrates that cows have individual personalities and complex emotions. Even though the Chick-fil-A cows are an advertising creation, they still imitate the real thing to a degree. The creative team that does the advertising for Chick-fil-A thinks of these cows as seven-year-old kids who are renegades. Mischievous, but not naughty. They have a fairly simple sense of humor. And if you've seen their signs, you know their spelling leaves a lot to be desired. Political correctness is lost on them. 
like when their message was, lose the burger belly, eat more chicken. They are also playful as they try to impersonate humans complete with costumes. The covert cows. They grab a person's attention. They are endearing as they convey an emotion. In addition, they communicate a truth. And in that, their story is timeless. Who else could get 470 college students to be dressed up as cows on Cow Appreciation Day at a chicken restaurant? And the Guinness Book of World Records was there to record it. The cows convey a message that is counter-cultural. On the taste bud level, it's save a cow, eat more chicken. But on the spiritual level, what could be more counter-cultural than closing a fast food empire because the scripture says, remember the Sabbath day keep it holy. In a culture that says, go, 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 these covert cows work for an employer who says, stop. Now, the thing is about Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A, when the covert cows first came out, the head of the Georgia Stock Association came to him and said, Truett, you own Angus. What's with this campaign? He just called in his chief marketing guy, and the guy said, Hey, my job is to sell chicken, and we're using cows to do it. It's self-preservation for the cows. Besides, can't you take a good joke? Truett, the founder of Chick-fil-A, never attended college. He had a speech impediment when he was younger. Sound like anyone that you've become familiar with through our journey through Exodus? Some might say his approach to business was a bit unorthodox. For example, he believed that Chick-fil-A was God's company, not his. It was God's company, and he was the steward of that company, which meant tithing corporate profits. It meant having a written purpose statement that declares why Chick-fil-A exists. Quote, to glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that is entrusted to us and to have a positive influence on all who come in contact with Chick-fil-A, end quote. These covert cows send a subliminal message drawn from Genesis 2. Genesis says, by the seventh day, God had finished his work. On the seventh day, God rested from all his work. He blessed the seventh day. He made it a holy day because on that day, he rested from all his work, all the creating that he had done, end quote. If God is the everlasting Lord who neither faints nor grows weary, as the prophet Isaiah says, and if he is great and mighty in power, as Psalm 147.5 says, and if he spoke creation into existence, as Psalm 33 and Genesis 2 declare, why does he need rest? The Hebrew word Shabbat, which we interpret rest, means rest to cease, to stop. God's work was finished, so he stopped. The Almighty ceased doing. By the end, at the end of each of the first six days, God declared what he had made as good. But the seventh day, he made holy. The first use of that word, holy, kadosh in the Hebrew. The first time it's used in the Bible is found in Genesis. And of all things, God applies it to time. 
Let that sink in. The first use of the word holy, God applies to time. Holiness in the realm of time. It is the crowning jewel of creation. A time not for doing, but a time for being. A time for being in the presence of God in a disciplined way. It's holy because the Holy One inhabits that time. He ensouls the day with His Spirit. The holiness of the seventh day comes long before Moses ever made the journey down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. It's written into creation itself. I find it intriguing that when you read through the commandments, that out of all the commandments... Remembering the Sabbath receives more explanation than any of the others. God kept a Sabbath. He built it into our DNA. The Sabbath is to be a day of ceasing from work. Yet, how often do we sit in church thinking about what we need to get done after church? How often are we planning on how we're going to get done what needs to be done? How often are we scheming about how to move this project along or finish that one? Though they never say it, seeing the covert cows send the message, not open on Sundays, it's the Sabbath. Cease doing. The paradox of Genesis 2 is that work is never actually complete without rest. That is, God stopped working and entered into the delight of the Sabbath. Can you imagine the confused looks? Can you feel the utter shock for the Hebrew people when Moses told them there would be no work on the Sabbath? They had no frame of reference for that. It was such a radical departure from everything they knew after living in Pharaoh's Egypt. After all, their lives were valued by what they produced. Sound familiar? They came from, from a worldview where the push to produce drove the entire economic system. It was more, more, more. Sound familiar? As cheap labor, they were an expendable commodity. Caring and compassion were not part of the program. When it came to death benefits, it was simple. The dead did not have to report to work. With the words, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, Moses sweeps away the materialistic worldview of Pharaoh. The command puts the brakes on fren frenetic production. It puts the brakes on the devaluation of life. It says there is more to life than the quest to have the newest, the latest, the most advanced. As Barbara Brown Taylor put it, quote, we have made an idol out of exhaustion, end quote. Busyness is a multifaceted excuse covering a multitude of sin. All a person has to do is trot out, oh, I'm just so busy, and that's all it takes. Too busy for this, for that, and of course, way too busy for this God stuff. If we're not running on empty, if the physical fuel gauge light isn't flashing, and the spiritual energy gauge isn't warning us, well then we just haven't done enough, or so we think. And then we see those blasted covert cows reminding us and the rest of American society that the Sabbath says, stop, cease desist. Keeping the Sabbath is actually a way to protest. Or as Walter Brueggemann puts it, quote, an act of resistance, 
end quote. In that, it hasn't changed since Moses first brought the commandment down Mount Sinai. It's a living declaration that boldly goes where only faith has gone before. We are not defined solely by what we do any more than Adam was defined solely as the caretaker of the garden. The Sabbath is an invitation in time from God himself for us to make ourselves available to the one who is the Lord of the Sabbath. Or, as Jesus said in Mark 2, quote, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath, end quote. The Sabbath offers us an alternative way of being in the world, an alternative way of living. Our culture tells us time is money. The Sabbath unapologetically declares, no, 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 time is life. Besides, can money buy us more time? Not hardly. What do we do with time? How do we manage the time that is our lives? It's been pointed out that time abhors a vacuum. We have all kinds of time-saving devices. But whatever time we save, we spend it somewhere else on something else. Free time, that time that is not programmed, has a knack for making us extremely uncomfortable. That feeling is compounded by the fact that once a week, every week, along comes the Sabbath. Isaiah 58 instructs us to call the Sabbath a delight. We read that verse and go, really? It's a day that reminds us that God is God and that we are not. It's a day where the God who created time flat out says to us, this is our time, your time and mine. Come, discover the richness of this day designed to give, designed to share, instead of having to own and be in charge. I've created this holiness in the realm of time to nurture the relationship between us, says the Lord. This is a sacred time, a time for facing sacred moments, end quote. Thus, the goal of the Sabbath is not to do or have, but to be, to be in the presence of the one who molded or modeled for us what the Sabbath is about. That's why he rested. He's saying, here's how it's done, folks. We are to keep the Sabbath holy, which means keeping it special, keeping it unique. And we are to do it again and again and again. This day of rest is more than an interlude. As one author put it, quote, keeping the Sabbath is a way of baptizing the coming week in the mercy and grace of God. What a concept. Keeping the Sabbath is a way of baptizing the coming week in the mercy and grace of God. We usually think of the seventh day as a day of recovery, from the week we've just survived. But what the scripture is depicting is radically different. Take Numbers 10, for example. During the wilderness wanderings, the Lord went before his people to find them a place to rest. The point, the Lord goes before us in advance to prepare us to enter the coming Sabbath. It prepares us to enter the coming week with a renewed sense of His presence. Thus, keeping the seventh day holy is an act of trust. It's part of the cow's covert message, that one right below the surface, that the Lord of the Sabbath will provide even if they go against the grain and are not open on Sunday. Could it be that 
those covert cows have a greater appreciation for the crown jewel of the Sabbath than many American Christians? Keeping the Sabbath. Moses warned the people of God back then, and his warning still rings true today when he said, Take care that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Even in the midst of pandemic, we have more blessings than most of the people in the world. Keeping the seventh day holy, unique, has long disappeared from the way our culture lives. The covert cows let their light shine when it comes to the crown jewel. Do we? Does the way we regard the Sabbath, the way we live out the Sabbath, reflect our love for God? Does it show an appreciation for His desire and His design for the day? Is it a day of ceasing from work? A day of resting as if all your work was done? Is it a day of embracing family and friends? Is it a day of feasting and sharing? Is it a day of faith and the play of imagination? Is it a day of tasting the richness of time? The Sabbath, a little bit of eternity in disguise. Covert cows and the crown jewel of keeping the Sabbath holy. Hmm. And here we thought their message was just eat more chicken. Amen. May God's Spirit guide us as we seek to remember the Sabbath, 
to enter into its holiness in the realm of time, to rest in the God who invites us to be in his eternal presence. Enter this coming week in his grace and in his mercy. Amen. Amen.